Hello, welcome to Hattrick. I'm Jordan Dollar Coltman, joined by Braden Dollar Coltman. Elliot is off uh, today to this week. Uh, he's he's uh, just not with us. So look, Braden, it's you and me. We've got lots to talk about. I know that you've been uh, very eager to get to off-season conversations. We are going to do that today, um, and then we'll dig into both the NBA and the NHL side of it. So uh, I think we should just get to it, don't you think? Let's do it. All right, here's topic one. All right, so... Uh, we're not wasting any time. We're getting right down to it because I know there's lots we want to discuss. We're going to start with the NHL off season. It's a weird off season, uh, just sort of schedule wise. July 1st has come and gone. That's, that's usually like almost the the tail. Well, it's kind of the tail end though, of what has already been a month of off season. You get the draft and then all the speculation about free agency. And then there's the frenzy. And then there's maybe two or three days after that. And then everything cools down until a couple of deals sort of get done near August. But really usually by this point, we're kind of already set. We kind of know what's happening. As well, the say, season July started late, is, is that right? Is that the yeah. reason for this? Yeah, we're still we in had the 82-game sh- season. Yeah, I think it was just the shift because of COVID. Uh, they had that hiatus window because of what would have been the Olympics that then became kind of that COVID break. Everything kind of got pushed and shuffled a little bit. This was always the plan, though, I think, coming out of COVID to have an extended season this year. The goal, I believe, next year is to get the, the season started on the regular pre-COVID schedule and then be able to have a, a traditional off-season, let's call it, schedule-wise, where we would have the draft late June, following the Stanley Cup finals, and then into the uh, free agency. Regardless, here we are. Free agency this year will happen July 13th. Uh, I believe the draft takes place on the 9th or 7th. Uh, it's on Thursday. What was okay, Thursday? so that's the, that's seventh. I was right. Seventh, I had yeah. for some reason I had seven and nine in my head. I don't know why I had the ninth. Yeah. Thing, but regardless, so the seventh is the draft. That's this Thursday. So we should talk about it. And then July thirteenth at noon, a free agency opens. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to quickly uh, run down a couple storylines for you, and I want you to just give me your best like hot take on each of these things, and then we okay. can dig into some of the big storylines. I'm going to give this, you. Uh, I love this. Yeah, I'm going to give you a couple names, and all I want you to tell me is, are they staying with the team that they're currently playing for? Are they re-signing, or okay. are they on the move? Okay. And then we can dig a little bit into why or why not, but here's how we started, okay? Sounds good. The biggest name, without question, contract, talent, skill-wise, available as UFA, is Johnny Gaudreau. Is he going to be a Calgary Flame next year, or is he on the move? This one's really intriguing right now um, because we know the Calgary's made an offer and a bold offer to try to retain him. I don't think he stays. I, I, I feel like uh, because of what you just said, he's such a high um, market guy and he really had a turnaround with Calgary last season and a successful season with them. I think he will demand uh, a lot of money and some, and I think he'll get that. And I don't, I don't think that that's going to be Calgary. So if it's not Calgary, I know I did yeah. this. I'm already breaking yeah. the rules games, yeah, but yeah, yeah, where yeah. do you think he could go? Who could afford him and where do you think he fits? I Is think there New, any teams yeah. out there? New Jersey needs uh, wingers. And I think the Islanders also are, are keen on this guy. They, they've got some openings on the wing. Um, a lot of speculation around Philadelphia being, I think is a hometown guy there, but uh, my I'm leaning towards uh, somewhere in the New York state. New York, New Jersey. All right. East yeah. coast. Well, it's certainly from Calgary's perspective, that would be ideal. They would not want him to be in, in division, uh, certainly and preferably out of the conference if they can't resign him. But as you say, they have made a big deal for him. All right. Next one. Uh, this one's a little more intriguing because he's a guy who was already moved during the year this year. He was traded out of Philadelphia at the deadline. Where does Claude Giroux end up? Does he re-sign with the Panthers who obviously oh were designed designing you know a team that was meant to go all the way this year they had a great regular season they added Claude as a um, you know um, a rental player I don't think there was a lot of expectation necessarily that he would stay there but he didn't get his ring there so he's on the move potentially do you think they retain him and more importantly I guess if it isn't Panthers where does closure yeah. I have a feeling that they will get a deal done here with Claude Giroux that that being said I, this is one that we could very well see a lot of teams being in on after having maybe a first option become unavailable. Um, I'm thinking even the Edmonton Oilers with an Evander Kane-like situation. If that doesn't go through, maybe there's a possibility to bring in someone like Claude Giroux, who still has a lot of miles left um, in the league. I think Colorado, Dallas, Nashville will all be teams uh, chomping at the bit for 
for someone like Claude Giroux, but I, but I have a feeling Florida's going to, to make this thing work. And, and I think Claude Giroux had a, like a, a pretty good time there. He, it was all kind of brief, but I think he saw the, the strides that Florida was making. And you know, the challenge with Claude though, is like the, he's still a, a very, very valuable offensive driven player who's going Absolutely. to demand a very big paycheck here. And, yeah. and I just don't know if Florida has the like cap space available to make this work. They've got a lot of young guys that are going to be at the end of their deals. They've already got a lot of top end talent that's locked up on big long-term deals. Like I just don't see it working long-term for Florida. And I would, be, I would not be surprised if he goes to a market that has some money and is looking for like a number one guy. I'm, I, and and a number this one may sound winger. insane. Or is he a right winger? I, guess I just mean like maybe their top offensive player. That's what okay. I'm saying. Like okay. There are teams out there who have cap space that are desperate for like a bona fide superstar okay. level who, player. Who now, do you think who do you think's got that? I would not be surprised if he went to the Montreal Canadiens uh, and became their veteran leader on that team. Or even like something like the Nashville Predators, who are kind of in this now perpetual, um, you know, tumble dryer of rebuilds, where they're constantly kind of trying to bring a couple pieces yes. in. It doesn't work. They just toss them out. But they they're building around Roman Yossi and this yeah. amazing decor, like they have for the last decade. They're still looking for that next level offensive guy, and they have some talent up there that I think he would really be able to work with. You know, I'm thinking Philip Forsberg if he does or does not sign in. Yeah. back with Nashville, you're going to need to either fill that spot or compliment him. So there's space available there too for the Prince. He's going to, yeah, he's going to improve any team he goes to. I I, I think the Montreal Canadiens is a really intriguing one. Um, having just lost Shea Weber and Carey, I mean, still situation with Carey Price is up in the air. Um, that leadership for sure. And, and they do have a strong young core here. They could, they could absolutely bounce things back if, if they added something like that. <laughs> Uh, All right. I'm really intrigued to see where where Claude Giroux goes, though. Okay. I got two more for you here. And these are kind of, these, these are the, the, one of these is a really big name. And then I think one of these is probably the more, I don't know, hometown pick that, let's say, but we, we, as Oilers fans, we're going to be interested in. But let's, Uh let's talk about Stanley Cup champion Nazem Kadri. Huge contributor, huge star of the playoffs in many ways for Colorado, a guy who, you know, had been very good but really has this season demonstrated he is a top talent in the league and capable of that. Now the question is, can he turn that over again, perhaps with another team? He's in his third season, obviously in Colorado. Uh, I believe he, uh, he had something like 87 points in six, 71 games, his r- career high. So he has done everything possible to increase the pop potential value as a UFA. He's done everything done right to go get the paycheck. He's mm-hmm. 31 years old. Um, the question is, is he going to be as successful on a team that doesn't have the likes of McKinnon and Ranton and Landis Cog feeding in the puck and working alongside him? Guys like Barakowski, who have also had career years this year. Obviously, Colorado had the perfect magic sauce going for them. Do you take Kadri out of that situation and does a little bit of the shine fade? Or is he just coming into his own as a bona fide superstar? The question is... <laughs> Does What's he stay in Colorado? Well, does he <laughs> right. stay in Colorado or does he have to go and prove it somewhere else? He, um, yeah. yeah, he doesn't stay in Colorado. I think Colorado knows that they can win without him. Uh, that said, he was a huge factor for, for the success of the season that they had. I think, though, that Kadri uh, will be too rich coming back for them. And a team, again, like I said, uh, a team that maybe loses out on a, a number one option uh, looks for Kadri. And that said, there's probably a ton of teams that Kadri will be their number one option um, that, that will that will make a swing and, and make a splash for Kadri. He, he's a great take a, Do you want to take a stab at where one of those destinations could be? Or is it the teams we've already been talking about for like a Johnny Goudreau? Is he kind of the, is. Yeah, like the I could plan. absolutely see Calgary going after Kadri if, if things with Goudreau don't work out. Obviously, they play different positions, but adding that kind of depth into their top six would help but i'm even thinking like if 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 philadelphia is looking at Goudreau, oh, sure. and let's say they don't get him oh is, yeah is is you know nazim kadri not number two a2 on their list the other team that's interesting calgary to me because philly got all new the york space. new jersey yeah, the, this is a bigger piece to beyond just this conversation, but I would, I would argue one of the more intriguing teams to look at this yeah. off season is going to be the Seattle Kraken because they've come off their debut season. They did a very, they had a very conservative approach to their um, expansion draft. And obviously it, 
wasn't a successful season, but they find themselves here going into this off season with $23 million in cap space. They have to spend it. Uh, the question is, do they play the role of like cap floor assistance to other teams, the way that Phoenix or Ottawa has in the past where they just basically take bad or even sort of useless contracts off of um, some teams hands and sort of get some prospects and continue to try to build towards the future with it? Or is Seattle now having to start to think about winning for the purposes of, uh, you know, legitimizing themselves both as a team, but also like kind of rewarding these fans who have been pretty, pretty spectacular so far in Seattle. The question is, is, is that not a team that would be taking swings at everybody, Kadri included, when it comes to, to seeing if anybody's interested in coming and trying to build something? And I guess the second part of that is, as a player, would you want to do that? I think if you're Ron Francis and that organization, you don't have enough seasons behind the team and the franchise and the organization uh, that that has the depth of uh, prospects in your pool to 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 be the cap floor guys and the guys that kind of okay, let's rebuild this. We just had an expansion draft, and you and you pick some you know high, high skilled players that should figured out. So I would give it another season and I would give it another season kind of focused on playoffs and focused on winning right now. Um, We saw success in Vegas and we're continuing to see success in Vegas. Um, Obviously they had, like you said, had a different expansion draft, but I think if you're that organization, you are, you're not swinging to, to clog your, you know, your books up with, with massive contracts and unnecessary deals. But I do think that you're making swings at, at, players that could make the organization better. And we've mentioned, I mean, uh, everyone we've mentioned now, I think Seattle should be in on. Okay. Last one for this one, um, this sort of structure here, we're going to dedicate a whole topic to what the Oilers need to do, but let's just stay on like the NHL side of it. I am going to go kind of Oilers related because it fit into a little game here. Great. October comes around. Uh Is Evander Kane still an Oiler or is he playing for another team? Oh, he better What's be more like an oiler. What's likely or what do I want to have happen? I no, mean, but like, it's what do you like, think will happen? Well, there's this huge question mark still in the air around this, uh, this, this grievance case. And sure. what's his contract look like? And who does he actually belong to? Is, does the San Jose Sharks have to swing a, a trade with another team to get him out if the, the contract is um, reinstated and, and, you know, what, what does all of that mean? So I would like that to get sorted out obviously before the July 13th uh, free agency period opens, but I have every faith that the Edmonton Oilers organization is doing everything that they can to bring in a guy who was absolutely uh, a game changer for them alongside Connor. I, th- I, th- I mean, yeah, you could try with another player like a Philip Forsberg and another guy is going to demand a big contract, but you've seen success with it already. And you took that risk. You gambled. It did. You, you're, you know, it paid off. So I feel like if, uh, if October comes around and Evander Kane is on the team, then, you know, they did everything they could to make it happen. Gosh, I hope that happens, man. I, I, it's hard well, to... here's the thing, and we'll get to the Oilers, as I said in a second. But you're absolutely right. I think the biggest question mark is how this grievance sort of hearing unfolds. I, I, for those who haven't been following it, the most bizarre thing to me about this is that apparently it's been delayed since the end of May because the arbiter, the league's arbiter responsible for this case, was on a vacation for the month of June. Arbiter pre like an arbor, like a tree cutter. Is it arbitrationist? No, he's an ar- arbiter. He's an arbitrator. Ar- 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 it, it, all right. Well, I don't right know. in front of me is league's arbiter. Okay, that's probably what it is. Arbiter? No, it's arbiter. Anyway, point being, he arbi- he he deals with arbitration cases. Yeah. And apparently takes the month of June off. Oh, nice. Um, but the dumb part to me about this <laughs> they don't is have you're really telling me that's what I was saying. You're really telling me the NHL has one of these people <laughs> now. It, he was assigned to this case. That's fine. But you're telling me that like, if he had a pre-scheduled month of June off, yeah. clearly the league does not consider this a priority. Yeah. Uh, they're not hiring another lawyer. And I'm sure there's some lawyers out there who would happily take the NHL's money to hold, to, to, to do this case. Point being, there has been some delay. There is some speculation that the, the arbitration hearing could last longer than the opening of free agency. And right. that 
is still a question mark, I guess, looming over all of this is does other, do other teams who may or may not be interested in Kane even approach it until they get that answer from the NHL. And secondarily, the, the, are the Oilers not in a very similar position where they can't, they can't just keep their powder dry for the purposes of saving space for Kane. If in doing so they lose out on Kane because of some weird hiccup that could come from this. And then they've also missed out on potential other options. It's a, tr- it's a really tricky situation to be in, but I think uh, the, that Ken Holland has already formed a relationship now with, with uh, Evander Kane that Kane has with the team. And I think that they will do the due diligence in, in ensuring that no matter what happens with this case, whether or not he, you know, the, the contract is reinstated in some ways, that's actually better for the Oilers. If that contract's reinstated, if still that they can, you know, get that contract, but it's going to be cheaper than it. And by cheaper, I mean, just shorter term. It's like three years left at 7 million when, based on the half season he played last year, he probably is demanding, you know, upwards of eight, eight and a half and, and longer term, uh, which the Oilers would have a harder time putting onto their books with the current situation. So there's, there's some of me that kind of hopes this happens and they still are able to work out a way to make, you know, make a, make a trade or find the contract back into the Oilers organization. But uh, it, it is precarious because you don't want to lose out. And, and, you know, there could be a case where San Jose says, no, nope, screw it. We're trading them to another organization and, and then they're hooped there too. So it is high risk, high reward once again with Evander Kane. All right. We're going to, as I say, uh, we will get to a more in-depth conversation around the Oilers uh, issue specifically in a moment. Let's wrap up this sort of NHL off season. It's, all, it's basically a preview at this point because nothing's really happened. I mean, obviously there was a trade today with Ryan McDonough, but it's been little little bits of flurries Brock here. Brock Bester uh, resigned. That was a yeah, definitely some big signings, and, and and we can talk about all of that when we get into the off season part of or a post post uh, a free agency part of this this show. Here's the last question I'm going to ask you. Draft is this week. Uh huh. You're Montreal. Yeah. Do you take Shane Wright or Slav? Gofsky or Slavkovsky. There you go. That's pretty good. The I don't think that's kid. good at all. I'm saying that off the top of my head. I'm not even looking at the Slav- Sla- Slav- Slavkovsky, I think. I think it's Slavkovsky or Slavkovsky. That sounds more likely. Slavkovsky. Where is he from? Finland. Finland? He's Finland. I, think, yeah. I thought he was Swedish. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you know what? He's actually he's Slovakian, but he's playing in Finland. Slavkovsky. Slavkovsky, he's, 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 he's Slovakian. Okay, sweet. Well, I think they take Shane Wright. I mean, there has been a lot of rumblings right now with New Jersey obviously does not want to draft another center. They will draft the best player available, but then have to move somebody because, you know, J- Jack Hughes, uh, he sure, they, they're just a little too clogged in the, up the up the pipe there. And uh, they need Slavkovsky on their team. And I think they'll get them if it's, it's funny though. Like, do they make a, tr- does Montreal make a trade down to get Shane Wright and still get Shane Wright? I, if you're one, two, just take the guy. Like, I, I don't see why they would take Slavkovsky at this point. Yes. Bob McKenzie's put him on the top uh, ranking in the world, but I think uh, the center has been highly, highly touted and he'll likely go number one. I think Kent Hughes or the, yeah, the, uh, is it Kent Hughes or the, the GM for Montreal? I think they've already stated this is the this is their focus. Okay, so uh, I asked one question. You gave me about four different answers. Slavkovsky or Shane Wright, you're Montreal picking at number one. You're on the clock. Well, I already answered this. I, Montreal takes Shane Wright. You they didn't know. hear that? Shane Wright, Part? number one overall. <laughs> wow, it got a little muddy in the confusion. Well, four questions, that. four answers, and all of them answered. I, I do right. think Montreal takes Shane Wright, and he'll be a great player. Really great player for Montreal. All right. There you go. All right. That's our off-season sort of preview lineup conversation. Let's leave it there for now. That's topic one. Topic two this week is brought to us by Busy Bee Vegan Skincare. Busy Bee is an all-natural skincare line dedicated to healthy, vegan, plant-based skincare and overall wellness. They offer a selection of handcrafted body scrubs, butters, and washes that not only make your skin glow, but smell amazing. Their unique all-natural scents include gingerbread, ruby grapefruit, caramel cake, and morning latte. So why not treat your skin to something fresh and all-natural? 
Head over to shopbusybevegan.com today. And as a special bonus, Busy Bee is offering listeners of this podcast a 15% discount on your first order with the code Ordinary Podcasts. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about the Oilers in a second, but we're going to stay on this sort of train about off seasoning and we're going to jump leagues for just a moment. Oh boy. The NBA off season, obviously well underway draft has already happened. Lots of things going down. It was a very eventful and, and dramatic draft to begin with. I think a lot of people were surprised by some picks that were made <laughs> some, some, you know, indecision by some teams. And then obviously, you know, just, as the NBA offseason has a, a, a tendency to do, something comes out of left field, a, sort of a, a big haymaker that doesn't catch anyone um, square, uh, that just sort of knocks you sideways. Kevin Durant has, has requested a trade. This follows, obviously, the first part of news out of the Nets, which is that Kyrie wanted a trade, but the Nets couldn't find a, a dance partner because of all the baggage attached to Kyrie. I think equally so, the baggage attached to Kyrie is what has led Kevin Durant to feel like he would like to leave Brooklyn. Obviously we've seen Kevin Durant move once before. It was a very big and very dramatic seismic shift in the NBA. He went to a championship team with the Warriors and helped them win another two. Then he moved to the Nets and all expectations. Yeah. Was all expect. Yeah. He won two there. All expectations when he went to Brooklyn was that championships or at least the opportunity to chase down championships would follow him. They did not. Now he came off an injury, la, 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 la. Steve Nash becomes coach, la, 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 la. Kyrie Irving's drama comes, la, 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 There's a whole bunch of, you know, the Nets is just its own package to unpack. Let's start with Kevin Durant, as it's obviously now become oh this big shadow over the NBA and the biggest story. Uh, Wojnarowski reporting that 16 teams have inquired. That's over half the league. Everybody who has space obviously wants this guy. Anyone who has an option and doesn't already have like a top three locked in wants this guy. They know that he's a, uh, a, a franchise direction changing kind of player. Not unlike, I would make the argument if you're a Raptors fan, not unlike going out and trading and getting Kawhi Leonard. It changed where that team was from a very, competitive team to a championship caliber team and they won a championship <clears throat> let's start there you're a raptors fan we know this uh-huh. should the raptors be going after kevin durant wait wait wait, and- wait let me let me answer this whole thing about kevin durant though this is it this is a bit of a different situation okay this is a different situation in that he still has a four-year guaranteed term on his contract and no trade clause so he can go anywhere. This is a bit unprecedented for this caliber of player. Ka- so is Kawhi this not like is this huge, not like the like the player empowerment era 2.0? Like now absolutely. we're into the next stage. This I'm is the it. craziest thing about the NBA. Like you said, the offseason is fun in the NHL, it's fun in the MLB. It's another level in the NBA because teams get ex- they just exploded. Like Rudy Gobert got traded for 10, 10 assets five of them being first round picks rudy gobert is not the best player in the league kevin durant is top three best players in the league okay so i'll go back to the question about the toronto raptors number one should the toronto raptors Uh, be doing what uh, should they be trying to trade for kevin durant and then secondly as a fan of that team what is the cost you are willing to pay for kevin durant okay so yes i think if you're an NBA, if you're a fan of an NBA team, the answer is yes, you want Kevin Durant on your team. And you will go, you will go above and beyond with, with assets and assets and first round picks, more first round picks than the Oklahoma City Thunder have, which is 17, in, I think, in the next three years. You will absolutely go above and beyond. However, as a Toronto Raptors fan, there are some intangibles where you look at would they if okay if scotty barnes involved in this trade i'm saying no i'm saying absolutely no this guy just won rookie of the year yes you're talking about kevin durant but you're talking about a future franchise player in scotty barnes the trick i think with every team is that if you give up everything the you know the the earth and the sky for kevin durant then who's kevin durant gonna play with uh that that's a, that's going to be a challenge for a lot of teams. Um, 
I think Toronto should see what they can do to make it happen. Massagiri is a mastermind when it comes to this kind of thing, but it isn't the same thing as it was with Kawhi when we traded DeMar DeRozan, the franchise guy, Jakoperto, a young upcoming center and one first round pick. It, it's just, there, we're going to have to offer, um, you know, it'd be Pascal, you'd be asking for, uh, well, the thing here too is it, the contracts, right? There's a certain number that has to be made for the contracts to go both ways. Pascal's would work. Uh, um, but Scotty Barnes alone and a whole bunch of things, it wouldn't work because he's only making like $7 million and you have to match, I think, 30 to Kevin Durant's 45 or something. So the question about what package would have to go back, um, like it'd be Siakam, it would be, you know, four or five future firsts, possibly Fred in that, either Fred or Gary Trent Jr., maybe Precious Achua. You're pretty much, you're, you're, you're saying, who do you want, Brooklyn? And if Scotty, but, but if Scotty Barnes is on that table, I, I'm saying no, I'd be pulling the plug on that. And you'd, you'd let him, you know, you'd let him go and fleece another team. <laughs> so speaking of the Scotty Barnes part of it, isn't there already an issue with trading? Like if Scotty Barnes is the best part of any of these deals, isn't there also like this rookie extension problem contract wise in the NBA? Aren't there rules about like you're, you're moving a player who's got like what, $45 million or something attached to him that if you're moving that player on a designated rookie extension, like they would have to be adding something back to Brooklyn to make that's up right. the losses. Right. Cause then that's Brooklyn right. otherwise is just, that's yeah. how Toronto got precious to chew out of Kyle Lowry signing. Right. So, so, okay. So your the question I guess that you've answered is yes at, 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 but there's a, there is, there's a line you would draw is Kevin Durant is not worth losing whatever that potential future of Scotty Barnes would be. That's the only player I would say this is it's off limits. Table but I would offer everybody else, anyone else. And four years, man, they, he's not walking away and going to LA the next year. Now you can demand a trade. Sure. But I guess that's the only part of this that, you know, Brooklyn thought they were getting them for another four years. Uh, it'll be, it'll be so, I mean, there's a lot of teams that this could really change. Um, right. Change so let's the, talk about that for a second. So who, if it's not Toronto, because obviously yeah. Toronto's in the conversation, but I, yeah. I, I, they're not, you know, Vegas certainly doesn't have them at the front of this. The question is who's got the pieces to move in the, the package and is willing to sort of go all in on it. So who are the other ones as our resident basketball guy that you would look at and say, that makes that, that would be a fit. And that probably Durant would want to go there. Yeah. Who would those be? Well, so Chris and I talked about this on the backyard basketball podcast, Portland would be so, so exciting to see um, Dame, Dame and KD together again you look at the things that they can give up it would be a weaker option I think for Brooklyn and Brooklyn's also in the they've got all the power here again like I said with the guaranteed contract they have no they do not need to trade this guy if they don't have everything that they want coming back to the team I don't think it's going to be a situation like James Harden or Ben Simmons where the guy sits out KD's not that kind of player he will play for Brooklyn if he has to uh, but the team I think that actually has the best option of getting Kevin Durant, dude, is the Golden State Warriors. They had mm-hmm. two years at the bottom of the league because they lost KD and then they ran into injuries. They had, they had, you know, they've had three lottery picks since then, and none of them have barely played, but they're all still valuable assets. And I think those, along with some firsts going back to Brooklyn, it would be like KD never left. And I think that they could Pretty win crazy. again. That's the craziest thing. Yeah. 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 And, Wouldn't that and, be a hell of a story eh? for uh, him to it'd be make his return back there? That would be something. Something. It'd be crazy. crazy. It'd be crazy. Right. I think Phoenix, the other, the other one, Phoenix would be really, really cool. But I think Phoenix is in the same situation with Toronto of going, hey, if Devin Booker is involved in this, there's no way we're making that happen. Fair enough. I guess he's the untouchable there. All right. Look. There's obviously lots of other things to talk about in the NBA. Do you want to pick off any one of them specifically? I know you guys talked about it on your own show, but for you, like what are the Rudy Gobert, huge, huge trade, obviously. What are the other, what are the other things that I guess are still to come here in the NBA off season that, that, or is this now just become the cork in the bottle? It's going to be between this and Kyrie, where are those two guys landing? It's so, it's Isn't so funny. Kyrie just going to stay there. Well, he's opted into his $37.5 million deal, and now he's pursuing a, 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 an option elsewhere. And I think with Brooklyn seeing now KD wants to go, you know, resting your 
your laurels and, and faith in a guy who was barely present last season is not the way to, to continue to build your franchise. And so I think it was one of those things where Kyrie went, well, I'm not going to be signing that much again. I'm going to opt into this contract. I can make this money this year. And if it's going to be Brooklyn, great. If it's going to be another team, great. Kyrie's Kyrie's not, he's not focused there. And I think he's, yeah, I, I think they're going to, I think they're going to try to move him. There's a lot of smoke uh, out of LA to reunite him with LeBron. Uh, I think the NBA offseason is far from over. We're only a week into having a free agency open and already we're just seeing some, some crazy, crazy things. Um, the draft was pretty exciting. Paolo Banchero went uh, first unexpectedly. Um the Raptors picked up a, a pretty exciting center, a low, low risk guy. Uh, he can play all of the positions, fellow Cameroonian, making Pascal happy if he stays there. Uh, yeah, the, the NBA offseason is always really, really crazy. I, I think come September when the season starts, uh, it's going to just be an absolutely different uh, landscape. All right. That is topic two. We will leave it there. Do you like fast cars? Do you like when they race? Whether you're a seasoned Formula One fan or you've just discovered the rush of racing, check out the Pit Stop Podcast presented by the Ordinary Podcasting Network. Join Jordan, Tyler, and Braden each week as they recap every race as well as break down the biggest stories on and off the track, all before setting you up for the next race in the Formula One schedule. The Pit Stop Podcast is available anywhere you get your podcast. All right, topic three, as promised, I've, I've strung Braden along here. I know you're ready to get going on it. The Edmonton Oilers are the focus we're going to give uh, a little bit of time here to off-season moves. Let's make it. Let's let's do th- let's do it this way. One, two, and three. I want you to rank the highest three priorities for the Edmonton Oilers, hmm. as far as you think. One, okay. two, and three. What's okay. the first priority? Cap space moving some massive unnecessary contracts out. <laughs> I don't care what you get back quite honestly, but Cassian needs to go. Um, I think the contract of Barry is one that you're looking to move. Um, there's another contract I was thinking of. Oh, which one am I thinking of? Well, is Chris, maybe, maybe is Chris Russell off the books? Nope. Yeah, Warren Fogel is the guy. That's right. Warren Fogel is the one. So that would be priority number one, trying to make that happen. If you can and do yeah, that before Chris, the draft, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Chris Russell is a UFA, so he's he UFA. Be, there's yeah. no value. There. But that was one that you were like, yeah, we don't need a guy paying. I think he had like three and a half or something, but he's been sitting in the press box most of the nights. Sure. All right. So that's that's your first priority is building cap space. What's number two? When you have that cap space, what are you going to go do? Under Kane. I think we talked about it early on. That's a, that's a, uh, something you already know works in the organization and you want to, uh, I think you want to lock that down. Okay. Number three. Goaltending. They need, they need something that they feel confident that they can improve on last season with, uh, because last season was an absolute shit show. Uh, Mike Smith had a great, end to the season i think Uh, i mean some kind of silly errors that i'm (laughs) tweaking out about because it it happened so uh consistently for both of our goaltenders last couple years so something that you can really rely on next season would be such a breath of fresh air all right, so let's dig into what those could be. We've talked a little, you've, you've, you've sort of given us a little tease of what the priority would be as far or how you would deal with the cap space. Obviously, the two big question marks still surrounding um, Duncan Keith, will he, won't he retire? It's feeling like I it's leaning towards will. won't. Yeah, I think he's got one, he's going to play out this contract and, and, and chase one more cup down. It does sound 
like the other potential retirement for the Oilers was Mike Smith, but I don't think that's going to happen either from the looks of it. Uh, and from reporting we've heard, although this has not yet been made official, it sounds like Mike Smith has enough injuries that they may be able to put him on long-term IR, bury the last 2.2 of his contract and take him off the book. So that would open up an additional a uh, little bit of money for the Edmonton Oilers. Looking at capfriendly.com right now, the Edmonton Oilers are projected to have $7.13 million of cap space. Obviously, you add an extra two to that if Mike Smith goes on IR. That does not yet have um, any of these potential RFAs or UFAs re-signed because there's right. currently right. on this team over half the players uh, that were on the team that finished playing hockey in the off season this year are currently un, uh, not contracted. Three of them are RFAs, two of them with arbitration rights. That's Ryan McLeod, Yessi Pugliarvi, and Kyler Yamamoto. We've had the conversation on this show already about which of those three, if it's one of them, you would pick. Um, uh, and obviously I would, I, I, I would, if I were betting on this, suggest <laughs> at least one of them is yeah. going to remain here and very possibly two of those, even if they are RFA'd uh, contracts, was, w- may be moved because there's value in moving them, even though, you, you know, there's no contract right. yet assigned to them. Let, th- let them go to somebody who can, who can sign them. Let's run down the UFAs really quickly. These are guys that the question... I'm going to simply ask you, do you re-sign them? Like, uh-huh. is there value there to be re-signed or is it just a let them blow in the Walk. wind? Josh yep. Archibald. Ooh, this is a tricky one because he was a valuable piece in the playoffs and he showed up, which was great. But I think there is an, I think they'll try to find another option there. Okay. Derek Broussard. No, I think this one goes, he was value. He uh, he has value. So I think if he becomes kind of, he was kind of like a Devon Shore guy, but I don't think this one's happening. Okay. Kyle Turris. No, definitely not. No, that was the biggest Colton mistake Seaver. in the last few years. Colton Seaver. <laughs> yes. I think he might actually get another PTO. Okay. And then Evander Kane, obviously we've already talked about. Let's run yes, down the two UFAs. Two UFAs. Cause one of these is a really big question mark for me. Uh, we, you mentioned Chris Russell. I have a feeling like they're probably just going to let cut bait unless he's taking like a minimum deal. Yeah, if and it's he's, a, he's a soldier that you know you can stick in there because totally. he has been a valuable piece. He can play NHL minutes. I guess is the more important thing, right? Yeah, uh, well, Brett, Kul- Brett Kulak is the big question mark. UFA trade deadline acquisition and and from my eye was a very valuable piece that this team desperately needed, which was just a steadier defensive hand. He played really, really well alongside uh, Evan Bouchard when he was on that line. He played a little bit with Tyson Berry. We've seen the value of having a guy who is defense first with some of these offensive guys. Um, Brett Kulak, would you resign him? And at what price? Uh, yes, I would resign him. He was not just a flash in the pan with the Montreal Canadiens and their cup run uh but he like you said played great defense and was a, a really great uh player on our back end that that i think they i think that they will focus on trying to retain him what he will ask for will be higher than what we want to give him that's probably the case all the time uh but i think i would i would go on a like a two or a three-year deal for around two two and a half if if he'll have it all right, so then let's talk about some of the potential options that are out there, and, and we can kind of grade these as, as what's there, right? So let's just for a second assume that they're signing either Ryan McLeod, Yessi Pugliarvi, or Yamamoto. We already had our debate here, um, so we're not going to get into which one of the three of them, but presumably there's space down one of the wings that needs to be filled. Let's yeah. also assume just for a second, just for – playing out the other options. I love let's playing say, out all the other options. Let's just say that Evander Kane has priced himself out of Edmonton. Like he's ah, proven jerk. this year that he's valuable enough and somebody's out there with more cap space is willing to make that move. Okay. Let's Always. just say that for a second. So you need a winger. I'm going to yeah. give you three names and then you get to pick. Yep. I love okay. this. All right. So you have, Dil- uh, no, you have Connor Brown out of, uh, out of, Ottawa. Wait, is this to replace Evander Kane, or is this just to add? These to are you? some options, and okay. these would be trade uh, options, right? So you'd right. be having to trade again, like a Cassian or a Puli RV or some valuable piece, and probably a pick for this. But these are some of the options at right wing. Which of these do you think is the is is the one of these three you would go after first? So we've got Connor Brown, who obviously adds adds some size, and yep. there's some you know some some good value there. He plays the right side. You have Andre Burakowski. 
who's going to be a UFA. So that wouldn't be a trade. That would be a signing. Mm. Obviously just won a Stanley Cup and was a valuable piece on that team. Or you have Mason Marchment out of Florida. I don't know much about Mason Marchment, but there's been a lot of chatter around his, his name. Yeah, he I think a pretty very good year, offensive think- player. Um, one of those guys who sort of checks a lot of the boxes, but doesn't excel specifically at one of them. Oh, um, I like only those had, kinds of players. <laughs> well, he had 47 points in 56 games last year. So low number, okay. but when you think about it, he only played 56. Uh-huh. But so, Evander Kane played how many? And so he's not that level for sure. But I, I mean, this guy, these, all of the guys you named kind of remind me of a Warren Fogel right now. So I think of the names, what was the second name? Barakowski. Yeah, that'd be the one that I'd be most excited about, I think, adding. adding. If they can make a trade for Connor Brown that involves moving out cap space, then I'm, yeah. I'm all in on that. So the challenges here, this is uh, what I would sort of, I don't know, be the caveat here. Barakowski, obviously, a very, very talented player. I believe he was 30, yeah, 34th overall among forwards at 5-on-5 five five goals. So right wow. up there in terms of elite. However... Uh, he has some of the worst analytics when it comes to defensive play. So he's not a great defensive offensive player. Now there okay. are spots on our roster where that would be okay. Yeah. We'd be replacing some players who arguably really not, not <laughs> great, um, but that's there. Um, let's jump then for a second to defense for just for fun. Cause. Oh yeah. Fun. Always for fun. Well, let's say you're not able to resign uh, Kulak. Kulak and you have a hole there now. Uh, and with some of that capped space, maybe that's a space they still believe they want some, some advantage. I'll give you three more names. Yeah. So it would be a trade again. So this is a player you'd have to go and give up an asset to get. You're not just signing him for nothing. So potentially also there'd be some cap space relief there. Car- Carson Susie out of Seattle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then let's jump to two UFAs. So I've got um, Jacob Chikrin. Yep. Or Travis Sanheim out of Philadelphia. So which of those three is the most (laughs) intriguing or the most, the best fit, let's say. Well, Jacob Chitron is on a different level than the other two you mentioned. Carson Susie is, has always been a solid player. And I think he would probably look really good on the Oilers blue line. Uh, But Chitron, if, if you can, if you can make a deal for to Arizona for Jacob Chitron, that's a deal you absolutely want to do. Remember, this was some somebody who would ask for trade mid-season and they were trying to find a, a place for him. He's got term left on his deal, and it's pretty low uh, for a guy who's a number one. You know, he could play number two. That pushes Duncan Keith back, which probably also helps us um, in the long run. Uh, yeah, yeah. so of the three of those, Jacob Chichen is the guy that I'd be most excited about. When it comes to that position for the Oilers, though, I would love to see Philip Broberg have a look and actually be the guy that makes that situation better. Okay, so then let me let me play out some big names here, and I want you to tell me if if any of these are worth taking a swing at. Okay. okay. Yep. So obviously, you're clear that you're looking for change. So I think you'd be happy to get after any of these guys if it worked, right? Of course. But, but let's just, is it worth giving up the assets necessary to get one of these guys? This is okay. And I mean, Jacob Chichron would be in that category because he's obviously yeah. going to be. If Scotty Barnes is involved. <laughs> that's what I'm asking, right? It's a no. What are you willing to give up for some of these guys? All right. Number one is Dylan Strom. Yeah, I am taking a swing for sure. Okay. He has what a qualifying I, yeah. offer is 3.6 million. Which right. is good value for what the Oilers player wouldn't have, right? He is a center, but he'd probably play left if he was on Connor's team. Sure. Uh, Jake DeBrusque. I think the boat sailed on this guy for me. He was somebody the Oilers were really trying to grasp at. Uh, it, it sounded like, I mean, the, the, the rumblings were around him for a while, obviously wanting out of Boston, but then re-signing. Um, Again, another kind of Warren Fogel guy. He's got good numbers and he's physical. <clears throat> um, but I think the I think the ship sailed for, for the Oilers to try to grab this guy. All right. And the last one here is Alex Debrinkit. Yeah, I mean, if you again you you so you've mentioned now two of Connor's junior line mates. And and to be fair, 
to bring it as a top five goal scorer in the entire NHL this season. So fantastic. Fantastic. And the, well, the challenge is it's a $6.4 million, <laughs> yeah. $6. million cap hit. Uh, he's a qualifying left? offer next year of a 9 million. Oh, so okay. to get him in here would, uh, would mean serious, serious. If, uh, if a Vander Kane doesn't work out, then there's, then there's options, but you'd still have to trade your first and, and yeah, Cooley RV. And so probably I'm going to give you prospect. I'm, we're going to move to goaltending just because we're running short on time, but I just want to put a name out we there are? because yeah, yeah, this isn't, this is a name that you you're going to laugh when I say it, because it's a guy I've constantly touted the analytics of, All but right. I just want to put on your radar. Do is not be surprised. Boom? Do not be surprised <laughs> if the Edmonton Oilers look to fill one of their offensive Gold. needs uh, with a depth guy. And his okay. name is Jasper Bratt. I love this guy. I know. I love Jasper Bratt. I think he's I one of the most underrated players in the league. I agree. I agree. And as long yeah. as everyone else keeps seeing that, there's oh, value. Man, to he's be such had. a goal. He's goal scorer. He he works both both sides of the ice. I I like this guy a lot. But where is he right now? New Jersey. Yeah. I see them giving it up. They they have so few All ringers. Right. <laughs> Let's go to goaltending because this is obviously the biggest and most important question that the Oilers will have to answer they took a huge swing at Markstrom a few years back that's the last time they genuinely went after a number one caliber goaltender with this kind of you know off-season move they are if look if 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 the rumor is true and Mike Smith is done if he's going on LTR and even if he's not, the end, the Oilers need a, a goalie. There's no question about that. I love all of the guys over at Oiler Nation, all tooting Skinner's horn. The guys played yeah, less than like 30 no, NHL games. You can't ha- hitch him to this cart and hope you're making the Stanley Cup final. No, no, of to course win you not. 30 games, 20 games, whatever That's it's right. going to be as a, as right. a backup goaltender, that'd be fine. Or play that many games. Should win. That'd be amazing. Well, he should absolutely win, though. That is our expectation. <laughs> no, but... Point being. All right. Uh, so I'm going to give you now three names. All right. All of them are UFAs. Yeah. And you only get one. Of course. Right? Of well, you can't three. have. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not like, I'm, we can dig in on why each one, but here, 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 here's the names. Uh-huh. <sighs> Jack so. Campbell. Yep. Let me uh, see if you can guess them. Yeah. Okay. Jack Campbell. Um, uh, Mark Andre Fleury. Oh wait, they're all UFAs. Oh yeah, he's no, he's three. I am. Uh, I'll give you a wild card in a second, but no. And then the third one is uh, oh, Huso. That's right, the, Billy Huso out of St. Louis. Uh, well, okay. So, <laughs> who do I want? I think every single one of these guys comes with high risk, high reward, and maybe that's just the position of goaltending. Uh, yeah, I think it is. But I really do think it is. Huso is it, it Huso is Huso has played how many games? 53. He's uh, barely played a full sure. season in the league. He had a very good year, but that but I want to I just don't trust it yet. I don't trust paying a guy after one season. That's that's hard, especially in that position. Okay, so and, I'm gonna give you a name though, and I'm gonna tell you this. If you had a do-over. In the last yeah. 10 years, goaltending wise. Yeah. Would the first guy that you would take another swing at not be Cam Talbot? Uh, yes. However, if I was to do a do over a goaltender in the 2012 NHL entry draft, yeah, sure. I would have taken Andre Vasilevsky yeah, first sure. overall. 100%. 100%. But you don't get that kind of do over. All I'm pointing out is the most success I think the Oilers have had when it came to finding a starting goaltender who was ready to be to step into that role was Cam Talbot, who is in the exact same position that Ville Husso was, it has been. He was the backup to Lundquist in New York. He was never getting that net until Lundquist retired. He was all the potential in the world, all oh, of yeah. the great stats in the world. Did, and Cam why, Talbot yeah. came in to the Oilers and did exactly what he was asked to in season one, yeah. took them to the playoffs. And then, yeah, it didn't work. It didn't fit. The, the, the team was horrible why. in front of him following that season there was a lot of problems but i don't think you can blame it on cam talbot exclusively and then look no, he's even found some i mean is he a, is he a lights out 
you know, Stanley Cup winning goaltender somewhere else? No, but, but he's he an all star. Minnesota, yeah, he got Minnesota back to the playoffs even before Mark Andre Fleury joined in, and then for some reason they gave Fleury the net in the playoffs, and they found themselves on the outs again. Cam Talbot is a genuine, good, genuinely good goaltender, and all the potential was there. Vili Husso has better numbers in fifty six games played than Cam Talbot even came close to. He has thirty four wins, thirteen losses, seven overtime. Uh, losses. Here's the thing for me though, that is the most impressive. Okay. Uh, and, and for me, the reason why of these three guys, I would definitely be saying Billy Husso has to be your number. That's one your guy. guy. He is 100% my guy. Okay. 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 His ex- I, didn't, I didn't anticipate that. He led the league in save percentage above expected, which is a weird analytical stat. It sounds a lot like baseball, yeah. but he was expected to have a save percentage of 0.88 <laughs> and his actual save percentage was 0.91. So he exceeded the analytic right. expectations yeah. of him going into that season. What that well, tells me on, is that he is getting better. That okay? is a silly stat because no, if he, not. but if he's played more games in the league, that expect that, uh, that number would be higher, obviously. So then the discrepancy in the number that he actually got wouldn't be all that fantastic. You're suggesting he played more games than he was expected to play is what you're saying. Well, I'm saying that, that, well, what's that stat based off of? Based off of how many games you usually play, right? Like sure, probably. Expected, yeah, based on yeah. what that, well, right. what the expectation of what games but, you're playing is, yeah. Right. So him being a rookie, that expected number would be Maybe. significantly lower. I think than yeah. some of the other guys that we're comparing here to. I mean, it, it, yeah, you're right. He had really great numbers, and I'm also excited about the statistics there. And Ken Holland's a goalie; like he's a goalie guy. He he wants to get this right. And I think if Huso, if if they see, I think they tried to get Huso at the deadline. I think everybody tried to get Huso at the deadline. Well, and that's the other thing. This is going to be a very crowded. Um, you know, bitter market here where these guys are coming every, like every team that needs a goalie, obviously Toronto, uh, I mean, name half the teams in the league are going to be asking and knocking on this kid's door and he's going to get his pick. Now the question is, does he see the value in being on, you know, behind a a McDavid led team where there's an opportunity to win or not? Um, You know, that's the big question. So, but I think for me, that would be the first target you have to go after is, is who so he's just he, he put he just put every um i mean he just put it all together in the right way and he's only going to be getting uh, arguably he can only get better because he hasn't played as much you know what i mean um he, he literally save percentage in the entire league he's the eighth best goaltender for the entire season when you look at wins i mean he sits he's sitting in the top 20 there too so of all these goaltenders you know you're you're, you're doing your job uh and obviously you got st louis to the playoffs you know, with a kind of in and out Bennington, he was their, their best goaltender all season, obviously. So I don't no, know. For I me, did, he's it, the most, it's the most upside, but as you say, yeah, obviously well, the risk. risk here too, is the Oilers have like constantly gone after backups who have done really, really well. Uh, uh, what's that guy's name? Ben Scrivens. Uh, uh, Vic, uh, who did we have fast or yeah. Victor fast. We had, um, well, yeah, Cam Talbot would have been one of the anomalies there, yeah. but yep. Yeah. You know, okay, so then let's talk about the other two there. guys. Let's talk really quickly about the other two guys. So you've got you've got um, Jack Campbell, who's proven he can be an NHL starter in Toronto, but could not get them over the hump in Toronto. And as a guy who's been kind of in and out a little bit with injury in the last little bit, but a guy who proved he could do the job. Question is, can he do the job in Edmonton, given what we have? Um, and then, I mean, Mark Andre Fleury has the resume of resumes, but is Mark Andre Fleury what he was? A year ago, two well years ago, three years ago, Mike Smith, man, like that's what I mean. Age wise, it's certainly oh, a gamble no. for its own reason. Okay, he had so, a good season last year, but so how much those money guys will for a he second. ask for? Totally, let's leave those guys for a second and let's play out the final part of this, which is: is it is this a position that to get what you actually need and want, you have to make a trade? Yeah, or build or draft it. I mean, we had an option sure, in just that we can't wait for year. that. You can't well, wait for that. Maybe no, but you like can't I wait for that. The there's, no, podcast, there's no top five. You should goalie. strap some pads onto Jesse Pooley RV and, and get that thing going. Yeah. I have okay. no idea how, no, so, how okay. You... So let me give you the two options that are out there for trade. And again, the conversation comes back to where do you want to spend your assets? Are you going to spend your assets going after a Debrinket or going after a chicken? Mm-hmm. Are you going to spend your assets going after a Connor Hullabuck mm-hmm. or Alex Gorgiev? 
I'm sorry. Did you say Connor Hellebuck? Like the Winnipeg Jets? Yeah. I'll start going. I said Connor Hellebuck. Why would they want to move him? They're not rebuilding yet. Are they? I don't think they're rebuilding yet. Okay. Maybe. I don't think that happens. I I, I did hear rumors around that one too, but I don't think that that happens. They'd be hooped if they lost Connor Hellebuck. I don't. I'm not here. This is not a. (laughs) This is not a topic about how or not to help the Jets. We're talking about helping the owners. Well, yeah, absolutely. If you could, hey, heck, if if Tampa's trapped and you could get Vasilevsky. Absolutely swing for fences. Uh, Gorgiev would be awesome. But again, one of those situations where you're you're asking a, a backup who had a really good season to be your number one guy. And I'm not, I don't know. I don't, it's another high risk, high reward thing. Uh, there's been lots of rumblings around uh, who's John Gibson and Anaheim. It sounds out. like he's going to go out to the East. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, it sounds like New Jersey. Yay. All right, so maybe, let me I uh, maybe try to let me take you out of your misery. Let me take you out of your misery. There's so few goalies. That's the point. There's That's so the few goalies. Let me take you out of your misery there for a second. Let's do okay. one last piece to this. Okay. Let's presume the Oilers are not trading the first overall or the first draft pick, the first round pick. That's what I it's, say. it's about time they do. I, I guess yes, I know you've <laughs> I you have expressed this, and I do not disagree with you. I think that Ken Holland. Uh, does not necessarily understand what all in means only because he constantly asks, what does that mean all in? Um, But I'm going to ask you this. The Edmonton Uh, Oilers right now, I believe are picking 19th. Is that right? uh, uh, Actually 29th. (laughs) Oh shoot. They were much worse than I thought they did get to the Uh first round, didn't they? Yeah. 29th. It's a late first round pick. It's a late first round pick. Does that not make it easier to trade it? Um, Well, yeah, but the value is less. Sure. Fair I mean, enough. it's a first round. The other problem here is that the Oilers don't have many draft picks this year. We, I think we, our next pick is in the third or fourth round. Okay. So again, let's do this. Who, if you keep the pick of the players you've looked at there, because let's be honest, we all know you've gone through some yeah, not draft boards. Much. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're the only person I know who who knows like the first three rounds worth of players' yeah, names. Yeah, but when it's like the when it's the 29th pick, you're a little less enthused into into investigating the the random names that are at the back end of the first round. Uh, but I will give you a name. Uh, <laughs> let's ha- let's see. Yeah, who is it? It's um. It's I don't know. I know really nothing about this guy, but his name uh, yeah. is enough to draft him, and that is Jagger Furkus. Jagger Furcus from the Moose Jaw Warriors. Okay, that's pretty is much he, is all he not I can projected tell much you. higher than twenty nine. He's right projected twenty six, but here's the thing with Jagger Furcus. He's another one of those uh, undersized players that will likely fall past where that he he's projected to go. Um, really great. Uh, uh, he's got a really great shot. He can score. He's a winger. Uh, yeah, that's pretty so much all I know about him. His name's Jagger Furcus. <laughs> it's that. the same reason I was thrilled when I knew no one in the draft the year that uh, Yamo got selected. And I think we picked 20, 22nd or something like that. And I was like, I just hope they picked a guy named Yamamoto. Sure enough, the Oilers did it. So here's hoping the Oilers will again, return to picking a guy with a fantastic name. All right. Look, it'll be fun either way. It's all going to come down pretty quick here. We'll find out uh, in a couple couple of days where where the Oilers, whether or not the Oilers make that draft pick or not. And then uh, by this time next week, we'll, we'll be fully into preparing for the off-season part of the UFAs. Thank you, Braden. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for listening. If you haven't already, please go subscribe on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram, as always. And uh, if you want to learn more about the Ordinary Podcasting Network, head on over to OrdinaryPodcasts.com. That was Hattrick. Hattrick is a member of the Ordinary Podcasting Network. It's produced every week by Jordan Dyler-Coltman and Braden Dyler-Coltman. 
can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. The Ordinary Podcasting Network wishes to acknowledge that the lands on which our conversations take place include Treaty 6 territory, the traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux peoples, as well as the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. And we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live, create, and share stories on these territories. The Ordinary Podcasting Network intends to engage in conversations and dialogue, which acknowledge that reconciliation is not a destination, but a journey, and that we remain committed to practicing our craft in a decolonized space.